Hello and welcome back to Premier Injuries, where today we're doing our first match day analysis. Now, it does sound a little bit weird, I think, that the Euros have named it very weirdly, calling it Match Day 1, which encapsulates all the fixtures up until now. So we're going to do a big review. Now, before we get into the injury updates, how teams have played, XG, all that good data, I do want to make sure that you click that subscribe button because I'm doing, doing daily content on here. Ben is kind of through me giving you content as well. He keeps me updated with all these essential info and injury and, and updates like that. So you're getting really high quality stuff here through the channel. Make sure to like, share the video and comment below as well. You can send us in some requests. I actually had one on Twitter today from Anand, one of our great kind of viewers and listeners that they've been a really good supporter. We had another one this week in terms of XG. So really, this is your channel as much as it is ours. But yes, Ben, how has your start to the Euros been in terms of fan team and in terms of your Euro fantasy? Um, fan team, pretty solid start. Um, I wouldn't say I've blown anybody away. Um, but got off to a decent start. Some nice picks in there. Um, I think the Mounier one was was one of the standouts, of course. Lukaku was good. Um, I finished on a little bit of a damn square, but I expected it. I, I plumped for Griezmann and Bernardo Silva were the two in the team that I'm um, doing quite well with. So I expected... You know, maybe a decent return of that that hasn't transpired. Really, really struggled with Euro fantasy. It was a last minute deal. Uh, I had didn't really have a lot of interest, and the idea was I had done a lot of research for fan team. I had done a lot of podcasts. We had discussed a lot of players, so I had uh, almost a, a squad that are in your own head that are wanted to, to pick but the budget the differences between the fan team and the euro budget were were apps just huge it's dreadful uh, isn't it yeah the, uh, I, I think I, they overpriced so many assets i couldn't get anywhere near um and it was it was on the friday the the site was slow it was it was crashing on my desktop so i had to go on through my phone and, and in the end i ended up getting what I thought was 11 half decent players. And then my bench was made up of um, just fodder. And I thought, right, well, fair enough. A couple of those players we had discussed either with yourself or with who scored. Um, and, it, and it was, I, I shoehorned them in on price. I had done very little research on them myself. Prime example was, was Steven Berghaus. Um, you know, had a great domestic, had three great domestic seasons. His stats were off the charts, obviously didn't play. Um, love the fan team set and forget. That's my game. Get me head around this, these uh, Euro captaincy changes and this, that and the other. Sub um, in, sub out. It, it, yeah. it complicates I, I it too much. I, I initially went with Lukaku. Um so he was me, me captain. And then all of a sudden, Switzerland got playing Wales on the afternoon. And I thought, oh, I'll switch to Rodriguez. He may get a clean sheet. He may get a penalty. And then if he doesn't, I'll switch back to Lukaku. Not knowing that you couldn't um, switch back on, on the same day. Uh, so then me, me, me captaincy went over to, to Berghaus on the Sunday, who didn't play. Then on the Monday, it went across to, I think it was, uh, was it Lewandowski? Might be. Um, and then, so that happened nothing. And then tonight, uh, Tuesday, it went on to Bernardo Silva. So every captaincy pick that I could have possibly went for bombed, apart from me original, Lukaku. Um, so needless to say, my Euro team absolutely stinks. <laughs> uh, I'm on. Uh, I've given up already. Uh, Twenty five points or something. Are you going to do a uh, differential dinnery run on that one then? You know, I, I just I've got the only reason I got roped into it is because of 
the lads put a mini league together and it was like, how are the three will have just a, a bit of a shout out, um, put a tenner in. Uh, there's a 15 in the group, we'll put a 10 on that, but us three will have one, and whoever loses buys the hard rock. And I just feel like saying, well, I just got a hard rock, we'll just get the food in, because <laughs> I just I, I just don't like it at all. I just cannot be chewed and bothered. But one, trying to work out, like, I had my team, my team was mint, <laughs> but the fact that I just couldn't get it in because of those prices done me head in. So your um, your fan team was min. I mean, just quickly, final thing on it. What is your rank in terms of fan team? You've kind of explained that your Euro team is is a write off. So do you want to give us an insight? Or do you want to keep us on our toes till a little bit later in terms of your actual rank? Well, I've been obviously waiting for the updates from tonight's game for that to filter through. Heading into tonight's matches, uh, all three teams were in the money, not massive amounts. But I would have been talking um, three figures from that, so I would have been happy with that. Oof. We will see the Ronaldo up until the 84th minute. You know, the two big players I went against, in, in, you know, um, were Harry Kane and uh, Cristiano. Those were the two big gambles. And one game and 84 minutes in, I was very pleased with that decision. And then, of course, we all know what happened tonight against Hungary. So I expect that decision, the omission of, of Winker, probably hit my overall rank pretty hard. Yeah, I I started off my Euro Fantasy kind of on a high. I think I got up to top 7,000. Uh, and then after the last couple of games, Torres did damn all. Uh, Bernardo Silva did damn all. Harry Kane was no good. Thankfully, I kept the captaincy on Spinozola. And so overall, I've finished off at the moment with 67 points, uh, which isn't too bad at all. And I think that puts me around 50k. So looking quite good in that. And then in terms of fan team, I'm around 1,900, 2,000th. So again, in the money by uh, a fair bit, actually. And Cristiano Ronaldo did me proud there. So I've got two teams. The second team... Uh, um, bloody Lewandowski just absolutely bombed that one but yes so the important thing about going into the next game week a lot of people are talking about kind of uh, injuries there's quite a few stories going around one of the big ones I think is Jack Raylish though Ben but do you want to give us kind of a team by team player by player quick update if you think these players are going to be starting starting off with maybe Graylish? Um, I mean, the long and short of it is he isn't injured. Um, the, the still, the, you know, the story emanates from the fact that he trained away from the main group today, um, and and that's been quite indicative of, of what's been happening at Aston Villa anyway for the last couple of months, working away from the, the main group on an individual training plan, and um, managing his load. We know that he has an ongoing shin issue um, that you know that needs to be manage very carefully uh, and that's all it is really so it's it's not an injury as such it's more of a precautionary measure and you know they don't want to try and they're trying to mitigate any issues with maybe you know hopefully getting some competitive minutes under his belt as this as a tournament goes on so good news in that respect like I say nothing um nothing new to what's been happening down at, at, at Bodymore Heath uh, with Aston Villa. Um, it's just that it obviously he, he isn't playing for England when he's at Villa and the cameras aren't on him 24-7, so it's not really a massive story. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's good news with that respect. And just a reminder to people, do check out the Premier Injuries website. We've got the Euro dedicated injury table on there. I think Italy is the next one that a lot of people are interested about. Florenzi and Berardi are the big names there. What are the updates on those two individuals? Um, Berardi was more of a precautionary measure. If you've seen the game, it looked fairly innocuous. A little bit of a, a tap on the back of his calf, to be honest. Um, uh, Italian... Uh, doctor came out and he said, look, just a knock, nothing to worry about. Um, we fully expect him to be involved in the squad. Slightly different with Florenzi. That was, um, he came in 
to the tournament and that game with a slight muscle issue. And that calf flared up during that game. He was forced off at half time. There's a little bit of tightness in there. But speaking on Sunday night, the team doctor was hopeful of a return to training. So, you know, he has trained with the group now. And again, you know, providing there are no reaction, then he should be a part of that Italian squad on Wednesday. Uh, looking at the Belgium side now, there's probably some good news and some bad news as well. Let's start off with the good news, though. De Bruyne and Hazard, do you think that they'll start the next game? Um, ooh, De Bruyne has just returned to full training, so he's just started back with the group. Um, it, it, look, it's, it's a big call. Belgium obviously done very well in their opening fixture. For me, I think it's likely that Roberto Martinez will probably ease him back in. Uh, you know, Eden Hazard is certainly ahead of him, I would think, in the in the pecking order, just in terms of, of maybe minutes. It may be uh, introduced from the bench as well for Hazard this time. And once that uh, group's been sewn up with back-to-back -back wins that we would expect, you know, then maybe they start that third game, which potentially could be a dead rubber. Moving the attention to the bad news, potentially, Vertonghen and Castagne have both been injured. I think Castagne's is much more serious, but is Vertonghen also going to miss the next game as well? Um, no, would, would be the... Um... Would be my opinion. It was it described as a footballer's injury in knock on the ankle. Um, I don't know if you've seen it. He, he sort of got a nudge. He was kicking the ball. He stood, caught the turf. Uh, it looked pretty innocuous. It, again, it's certainly nothing too serious. So I would expect for Tongan to recover from that. But you're right with regards to Castagna. Um, double um, fracture of the eye socket. And now he's been, uh, he's either been scheduled for surgery, he's already had that surgery, uh, in the hope that he will be uh, available in return for Leicester in pre-season. So moving to another team, this is one that might be a uh, cause of problem to England in Group D, but they've already played them, they've already beaten them. Barisic is one of the Croatian players out. What's the update on him? Yeah, so again, he's coming to the tournament um, on the back of a, a slight issue. Um, he missed the last couple of games, I think, was for, for Rangers in the Scottish Premier League. Earlier in the week, uh, he had a scan on a lower back problem. Now, that MRI came back pretty clear, so there's nothing significant or severe around that. Um, he was expected to train uh, with the group, so Barisic, you know, he's a good chance of maybe being involved in match day two, if not match day three. Moving on to the free lines, I think there's a lot of attention on Harry Maguire's fitness. Is he going to make that all-important big derby against Scotland? Uh, again, I'd probably suggest that that's not the case. You know, we're talking about maybe only a, a handful of um, full training sessions under his belt. And, you know, you look at the way of maybe def England defended in match day one and in Gareth Southgate would probably likely to keep faith in them. I think realistically, you know, if England get another win, then maybe uh, Harry Maguire in match day three, just to get some minutes under his belt, you know, with, with a view maybe to, to, as the tournament goes on, hopefully, you know, Maguire sort of, you know, being played into this tournament and getting that little bit of sharpness and match, match fitness. Moving on to the Dutch side, De Lee was somebody that missed out. And Winyal as well. Now, am I right in guessing that Winyal was purely tactical and this was kind of De Boer spiting the FPL community uh, as well as letting two goals in in terms of terrible management? But what was De Lee's issue? De Lee's, he's had a groin problem. Now, it was an issue that was being managed up until match day one. And the player himself was fairly confident of a recovery. Now, as we know, you know, with the ductor groin problems uh, and, and any soft tissue injury, you don't want to risk anything unnecessarily. Um, you know, that would potentially, you know, a two to three week minor tear even would rule him out for the remainder of this tournament. So I think, again, you know, the Dutch medical team just err on the side of caution and delete. You know, he should be back uh, for match day two. 
Now, COVID-19 has hit some of the players at this tournament. Cancelo and Busquets are the big names that have missed out. Is there a return time for these two? Or because of the nature of the virus, there's no kind of set date that these players will be back in the squad? Well, Cancelo's actually been um, omitted now from the from the Portuguese squad. Uh, Diogo Dalot has been called up as his replacement at that Portuguese side. Um, slightly different with Sergio Bruce Guest. Um, Luis Enrique turned around and he said, look, um, one thing that has went in his favour, he was the first player to actually test positive. So, you know, he's had a, a good amount of time to recover from that. And Luis Enrique said, look, it doesn't matter how long it actually takes, we're going to wait for you. You know, there's no thoughts of you being sent home or, or so on and so forth. You know, we will be here. And again, it's one of those ones. It'll be, it's difficult to put a definitive timeline because these tests are ongoing. We've seen with Diego Lorente, um, he submitted a positive test, but he was back with the group within around about four to five days following two negative tests. And they sort of, you know, so it was... Um, and they said that that could have been a, a false positive. But with Sergio Busquets, he is asymptomatic, which means basically he, he tested positive, but he isn't showing any signs or symptoms, which means he has been able to train away from the main group. So when he does rejoin the squad, he should have a good, decent level, you know, base level of fitness. So why has Cancelo been managed a little bit differently? Um, you know, that'll come down to the to the national team bosses. You know, he, he'd be looking, as we know, I think Spain only called up initially 24 players in the squad um, and they didn't take their full quota up to the 26. I think Luis Enrique had a, um, you know, a fixed mind of, of what he actually wants and, and how the squad that he wanted to deal with. Slightly different with Portugal. You know, what we know is um, you, you're going to miss at least really to be realistic you know, seven to 10 days, you know, you could be back with the group at seven, you probably won't get thrown in, you know, Portuguese um, group games, um, you know, and do we want to take that chance? You know, do we want to risk it? Maybe not. So, you know, it's it's down to the individual. And it, it again, it just comes down to the fact that, well, you know, there are no guarantees. You know, we've seen, even when players return, we heard about the likes of Paul Pogba, the Alan San Maxims, um, I was talking to somebody um, at a club the other day. He said, you know, players returned from COVID. He said, within two weeks, he says, they were, they were finished. He says, they couldn't train. They were so heavily fatigued. Um, we just had to rest them. We had to just take them out the firing line. And of course, in tournament football, on, you know, you know one of the world's biggest stages, then it's going to be a calculated risk. And if you've got, you know, back up if you've got players that you can call upon to come into the squad you know then maybe you, you take that chance and uh, yeah so th that could have been in the thinking with certainly with Cancelo. The final player on the injury updates is Kieran Tierney is he going to be starting in that big derby at Wembley? Um, I would say yes um, <laughs> I would I would go you know, in terms of uh, how Gareth Southgate might line up, I, I don't think England will be too different um, to how they started against Croatia. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk around uh, why Tupia um, started on the left when uh, Gareth Southgate had the likes of Luke Shaw and um, Ben Chilwell at his disposal. Luke Shaw has been managing, if you've seen recent images from England training, he's actually got a, a little, a, what looks like, a, it's not a cast as such, it may be a little bit of a splint or it's bandage, but he damaged uh, tendons in his wrist, uh, and that was happened actually during the Premier League season for Manchester United, so while it is a slight issue, it's certainly nothing that would keep him out of playing, you know, he, he did do so at Man United in the Premier League, in the Europa League and the Europa League final, and also in those England friendlies. So it was purely a tactical decision. And Ben Chilwell, you know, he was just admitted from that initial squad based on the fact that, you know, Gareth felt that he wasn't maybe strong enough and, and, and he's slightly down that pecking order. So let's move it on to the next section that I've called the good, the bad, the ugly how teams have played and to anybody that's a spaghetti western fan out there 
I respect you. Going through the good teams, Ben, and you can add to any of these, I think the standouts for me have been Italy, Belgium, Ukraine, Sweden and Austria. But Austria with a little bit of context because obviously they played North Macedonia. Italy, so much good data for them. And I would even say that they've gone beyond the dark horse status that you and I kind of talked about. Belgium, the only kind of negative that I have is that they're playing Denmark next. But I believe that they will kind of kick on Belgium. I think that a lot of people think that it's a harder fixture than it is for Belgium. And in Ukraine, Sweden and Austria have really impressed me so far in the tournament. But who's been your standout performers so far? Um, I, you know, I tipped Belgium from the very beginning uh, and, and they didn't really disappoint. They looked like they had gears to go through and, and cruised to that victory. I'm with you on Italy. I liked them. I thought the Turkish team actually started quite well for the first maybe 15, 20 minutes. Then they became a little bit passive. Then they stood off the Italians. And, you know, once you're giving it, you know, you know, those guys a little bit of time and space to play the ball around, then you're going to get punished and they're going to hurt you. Um, I don't want to read too much into these match day one fixtures. Uh, you know, it's not a huge data set. We're talking 90 minutes of football. And I, I'm, I tend to sort of veer down, you know, I'll, I'll go down the line of we've done a lot of research. You know, we've done our due deal and our thoughts and feelings on these teams heading into the tournament still stand strong. And I don't want to, to waver from that too much based on 90 minutes of football because from a fantasy perspective, I've done these knee-jerk reactions where I've seen those fixtures in, in round one and it hasn't quite clicked. I've jumped off assets only for those assets to start banging in match day two, match day three, um, you know, and, and live up to the sort of potential and the confidence that I had for them going into the tournament. So I'm trying to, to keep me powder dry <laughs> and, and, like I say, not look um, at too much into these, um, you know, round one games. Would you say that I'm getting a little bit too ahead of myself, though, with Austria? Because I was quite impressed with them. Really good ball playing ability. Looking at their underlying data as well, they were up there for key passes, kind of uh, expected assists, chances created. They were one of the best teams uh, in terms of big chances created as well. Or do I have to factor in the fact that they are playing North Macedonia in the first game? Well, you know what? I, I, I fancied North Macedonia to, to maybe cause a, a surprise uh, or two. If not results, certainly in, in the way they played. Austria flew under the radar, were one of those teams that only sort of came to light as the tournament, you know, uh, on, on, the, on the eve of the tournament. Uh, you looked at some of those individual players, you looked at the squad. I think I remember uh, covering a podcast and saying one of the only concerns I had was a recent World Cup qualifier when they lost 4 0 at home to Denmark. Um, but they played against England. And were very unfortunate, um, you know, to lose one nil on another night. They could have easily had a share of the spoil. So, look, they got a good result. And like I said, I don't think North Macedonia are any mugs. So, don't take anything away from that Austrian performance. But you know, they need to back it up. It's a, it, it's a tough group that one. It's a tough group to call, and I, I still don't think it's it's cut and dried yet. I certainly don't think that the Dutch, um, you know. Are, are guaranteed, you know, to to cruise the group like maybe everybody thinks they will. Well, let's move on to the Dutch then, because I think for me the standout bad performers have been Spain, the Netherlands, and Poland. I don't know if you'd add any to that group there, but I think Spain. You and I actually kind of voiced a little bit of worries over them, and I said that Ferran Torres was the only asset that I would go for. And even he let me down. Uh, he had literally kind of 0.09 XG contributed to the match. They just looked at odds. And I think this was the, the problem that I pointed out was the, the teams that they have to play against, they're almost their kryptonite style. Netherlands, the defence was really bad. Uh, and I think that De Boer's kind of added confusion and upset to that team there. 
going forward, they were kind of all right, but then Depay was just not in the game at all, and I think he is the most owned asset. And Poland were just absolutely dreadful. Lewandowski was totally starved of opportunities. But does anybody else have a bad performance to mind? And would you still temper your kind of interest uh, in kind of moving away from these assets, you know, Spain, Netherlands and Poland? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll address your first sort of question first. And um, who else? I thought Turkey. I was very disappointed with the Turkish team. Um, I know it was the opening match and I know the Italians are, are, are on now a 28 game unbeaten run. I think they've went nine straight without conceding. Um, so they had the form, um, they had the momentum, but like I say, the first 10, 15, even 20 minutes, Turkey um, started quite well. And, and I thought, you know, there had been a lot of talk, a lot of suggestion, mainly on the back of, again, fan team priced all of those assets up. Uh, extra, you know, very, very tempting. In and around that sort of four to four and a half million. I Maybe know. they knew something <laughs> that, that we didn't. Um, because they played like a team of four and four and a half million um, pound <laughs> assets. They were, I, I did like Lille Mass up front, but again, very isolated. Um, Turkey needed to be a lot more expansive. They needed to play on the front foot against that Italian team. You know, players who can, can play the role of bound are comfortable in possession. Uh, Turkey just needed to work a lot harder. Uh, and they just didn't get the grips, particularly, you know, with um, Spinozola. I think he, he got man of the match. He was a standout performer, covered a hell of a lot of ground. You know, on another night, we certainly got himself on the, on the score sheet. Um, so I was disappointed with Turkey. And I, I was also disappointed with um, the Swiss. You know, I, I think we had Wales. And I, you say... Um, you know, I mean this with no disrespect, but when you say that, what you really mean is you're going to disrespect us uh, because they expected Wales to be the whipping boys of the group. <laughs> um, you know, they, it's the Aaron Ramsey and the Gareth Bale are not the players that they once were. They're not the player. They're not these talismanic players that can grab this Welsh team by the scruff of the neck and and carry them to a higher level. Wales are managing. Um, Issues off the field, injuries, and and I expected I expected the Swiss to go out and and, and get a comfortable victory, uh, and keep a clean sheet first and foremost, and you know they didn't, and 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 I was disappointed with that. So that's my two biggest um, disappointment regarding the assets of, of of those teams. I had Lewandowski. I've got Ferran Torres. Um, my enthusiasm tempered. I, I think. I think you sold Ferran Torres to us. I'm I was sorry. never a hundred percent. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but you made such a compelling case, and the data, and you know, I've seen him at St James's Park, and he's got the potential. But I think the concerns that I voiced were, were putting a lot of pressure on a on a 21 year old, uh, you know, to come up and, and deliver, and. You know, that, that, that's a big pressure in his first sort of major tournament at, at senior level. Uh, so I was never wholly confident, but I was happy to be, I was happy to buy in to everything. Uh, I just don't know. I mean, the Spanish team looked great to a, you know, to a point. They had some good chances. Morata, an absolute... You know, he could have had uh, three, uh, you know, two or three at least. I think Lewandowski, again, I had concerns about him being isolated and this new manager coming in and I heard Polish reports and even, even a guy on our YouTube channel commented and he said, look, the new manager's come in, he's chopping and changing, he doesn't really uh, know what his settled 11 is and... When I expressed those concerns on another podcast with who scored, you know, I bow down to their uh, what a superior knowledge. He said, "No, no, this new guy's coming because 
they um, they recognised that Lewandowski needed that additional, and I think Zelinski was one of those ones that would come in, and so I was like, oh, yeah, okay then. And I mean, I think now across three major tournaments, I think Lewandowski has two goals. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, so I'm, I am a little bit worried, particularly in a game where you you would expect. Poland to go to town on Slovakia. Um, and if he was going to get goals and he was going to make the hair while the sun shine, then that was the game. That was. So I, I, I am slightly worried uh, in that regard. And um, who was your third team that you said disappointed? The Netherlands. <laughs> the Netherlands. Uh, I, I don't I think, think they disappointed too much. I just think that they were really bad, and and we yeah. both we both said that before the tournament started. Don't trust in the Dutch defense. Yeah, I think when when I've spoke to a lot of people and and a, uh, a lot of questions that appear on my timeline, most of those Dutch assets appear to be the more offensive and attacking. The Wijnaldums and the Dupai. So you know, I think they're still. Yeah, they kind of defend, but you know, if they're going to go out and score three goals, three or four goals every game, then those attacking assets are going to be decent owns. Yeah, I think we'll get on to the assets in a minute. My final point the ugly performances for me were England and France. I think England won very ugly. Uh, the, the game was all right, there was patches of brilliance, but really it wasn't a great one. And France. I mean, tonight they they played rough. They played dirty in terms of time wasting and things like that. But I was impressed by that. I think that sometimes champions know when to just not play the opposition, but actually play them at their own game and and get into their head. So I think that was good. And my shout out for not ugly is Sweden. I, I love the way that they just bossed that game. But let's move into best assets, defense, mid attack. Uh, the ones that I'm giving shout-outs to are Sweden's Marcus Denilsson in terms of 4.5 fantasy Euro asset. And in fan team, all Swedish defenders are 4.5. I think that those two games that they've got left in the group, they're really cheap, maybe enabler, and they could be a better own than somebody like Jason De Denea in terms of uh, Euro fantasy. And in terms of fan team, Maybe some of those other cheap 4.5 assets that we trusted in, I thought that he might do a lot better, Marcus Denilsson, or any of those Swedish assets in terms of fan team. Uh, because I think that the team has that ability to see games out. They won't score a lot of goals, but I think they'll keep clean sheets. Do you agree with that, Ben? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, look, got to make it difficult, work very, very hard. Um, know how to defend. First and foremost, you know, get that job done. Um, no airs, no graces, no frills. And yeah, from a from a fantasy perspective, that's always nice to see. And it's always refresh. You know, it's it's refreshing these days just to see defenders defend and not try to to overcomplicate things. So yeah, agree with you on that front. Uh, obviously, I think Spinazzola and Munier have kind of justified themselves Jordi Alba is probably the only one in the Spanish defence that I would actually have because even though uh, Laporte and Pau Torres played I think there is a chance that they might get rotated with other people in the team especially if Enrique thinks that it was playing out the back was part of the problem in creating their chances they're both left footed as well so it makes you wonder if maybe Enrique will go back to the classic tactics of a left footed centre back a right footed right centre back going forwards but Jordi Alba himself I think he's he's a good player I think Spain will keep clean sheets four chances created for teammates one big and attractive 0.45 XA the last one that I want to talk to you about Ben is Dumfries uh, he's kind of expensive 5.5 but he is in the top six for XGI of all players top four for XG of all players so far in the tournament he was phenomenal but the drawback for me is the bread and butter of these defensive asset is defensive points. But is he one of those players that you can trust as maybe we kind of did towards the end of the FPL season that he's just so good that he's going to get an attacking outlet? Or is that a little bit silly? 
you know, go back to to what I said, you know, during the the, the opening moments of this podcast. We've seen one game really, so you know, we haven't got a huge uh, amount of data to go from. Yes, it was a great performance. Yes, it looked great in terms of his heat map and what he can bring. Um, it won't take you know managers and coaches long at this level to try and sort of nullify that and exploit um, teams in be, in be, you know in behind that back line and you know Dubois might look at that and think well we conceded two goals against the Ukraine and, and may, we may want to temper our style you know we may want to hold him back a little bit so I get why people are, are excited um, but I think there are enough budget options out there um, to maybe you know justify spending you know maybe keeping your powder a little bit dry with Dumfries at the moment. You know, if the Dutch win the next game, does he even start, Yeah. Um, you know, match day three? I think if it was for me, I'd like to see how the Dutch go through this group stage and the Dutch maybe are looking at their assets, you know, once we get to that second knockout phase. Uh, kind of continuing the defensive discussions, are there any ones, any assets that come to your mind as should be considered? Dumfries was the one that I actually had sort of highlighted. Uh, you mentioned Mooney as well, who were, who were both sweet on. Again, there was concerns with regards to whether he would start, going back to the fact that Castagna is now ruled out of the tournament and the fact that Mooney um, got himself a goal, uh, an assist, then you know that locks him in. Uh, so those are two defensive assets that I really like. Um, but I think England, you know, if, if that opening performance was anything to go by, is that three 1 0 victories, uh, you know, consecutive 1 0 victories now? It's going to be, we'll keep it tight, you know, defences, you know, attackers might win your games, but defences can win your tournaments. And, you know, if we're going to go and, and do something new, um, in Newcastle, <laughs> England might have to do it really dirty. And I like, you know, John Stones. Uh, yes, he is a little bit of a, a, a premium asset for a defender, but I can see England keeping three clean sheets during this group phase. I think the other thing that backs up John Stones from uh, a fantasy point of view is he's probably going to get quite a few chances from set plays as well because uh, Southgate's almost shown his hand that he's going to prioritise that in games. The fact that Trippier was picked, he was almost shoehorned in as a, a left-back, even though he's a right-back. I think he did an alright job. In terms of open play, though, he had, I think, 0.03 XA. It all came from set pieces, and John Stones could profiteer off of that. On to the midfield. Insigne, I want to say, is the... Really, really good fan team pick. Five shots in total. And just to remind people that you get shot points in fan team. So it really rewards that. Four in the box, 0.5 XG. So in terms of the Italian midfielders, there's a lot of debate. Should you bring in Berardi? Should you bring in Insigne? Insigne is going to get you the goals and the shot points. Berardi might get you the assists. He was the most creative Italian uh, midfielder. But uh, I think that I would rather go with Insigne. But Two ones that might be under the surface still is Sabitza. I think that in terms of Ukraine and Netherlands, the two next games that are coming up for the Austrian team, we, we saw that Ukraine and Netherlands concede goals. So in terms of Sabitza himself, he had the most expected assist from open play of all players in the tournament so far. Obviously just one game, but three chances, two big chances created, I think looks good. And he also had the most passes into the 18-yard box. The other one, also from the same group, for the same reasons, I think there's going to be goals, goals, goals going forward. But Malinovsky for Ukraine, um, three chances created, three key passes in his game, one big chances uh, created, but also he is on set pieces and penalties for the Ukraine. He also had the second highest XGI of Ukrainian players in that first match. So, yeah, um, what do you think about those two calls and would you add any midfielders into the mix for you? Uh, yeah, look, you kind of argue with those picks. Um, great first game, data backs them up. 
uh, you know, I'm big on, on, on fan team. So they tick a lot of boxes on that format. And the only disappointment for me was that I had in senior uh, in my squad and, and had him as first sub. Um, so he, he sat on the bench and didn't come on. So that was a little, that was a, that was a tough one to take. Uh, who would I add in again, just from a, from a fantasy perspective uh, for fan team, uh, Olmo, um, he had five shots in that game, yeah, not successful, but you know, if the likes of maybe Morata aren't delivering, we've seen um, Marino miss a, a late one, you know, if they're not uh, in Ferran Torres, then it could be the likes of, of these almost that may pop up and, you know, keep on um, plugging away for this Spanish side. And the other one, which I was in two minds with leading up to the tournament and um, I, I sort of changed my view. I, I started off really warm, you know, the 10 days before the tournament start, and then I went cold. And then after that first game, um, I wish I had just went with the, the initial thoughts, and that was Jeannie Wijnaldum. Again, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, we talked about plenty of shots. Um, I expect him to play a little bit of a deeper role under De Boer as he had done uh, a slightly different role from than when he played under Koeman. But still dangerous, still at a great, a great price point. And if, you know, if the Dutch are going to go out and try to blow teams away with more thought on going forward, then I think Wijnaldum is a good pick. The funny thing is... it. Again, just to remind people, we don't tell each other which picks we're going to do. Wijnaldum was the third one on my list, but I, I thought, you know what, I've spoken a lot here. I, I think people <laughs> might think that I'm droning on too much, so I didn't mention him. I totally agree. Wijnaldum is a fantastic pick. He's in the top 10 players for XGI so far. Five shots. So good for those extra points in fan team as well. But he was almost like the Netherlands' most attacking player. Like I said... Depay almost let me down in terms of that first game. Whereas Wijnaldum, in terms of fantasy Euro, I did have Wijnaldum in my team. In terms of fan team, I had Depay in my team. Now I wish that I had Wijnaldum in both. And going forward, I think he's such a good pick. The final picks that we're going to get on to uh, and going into the final discussion points of tonight are attackers. I have to say that Immobile, I think he's a really really good pick for fan team because he shoots a hell of a lot those 24 shots are the most shots of any team taken uh, so in terms of Italy I don't mean Immobile took 24 shots that would be ridiculous the Italian team took 24 shots but he took a hell of a lot as well he had 0.93 xg uh, he had 1.01 xgi so it shows that all his involvement was just shot taking was you know really going for goal and I think up against Switzerland, Wales next. I really like those fixtures. As you said there, Switzerland, I didn't think looked as sturdy as I was expecting them to be. And I think they'll blow Wales out of the water. And switching to another one, this is a controversial pick in terms of his own actions, but Austria's Arnautovic. I think that in terms of when he was on the pitch for Austria, he was a menace. He was brilliant. Um, he looks like he's he doesn't eat food. He just eats pure anger because <laughs> when he gets out on the pitch, the, there's just like a fire in his belly. But it works for him. He got 0.46 XA and 0.27 XG in those minutes that he was on the pitch. And that actually translated to the fourth best minutes per chance created of any player in the tournament so far. So what do you think on those two, Ben? And do you want to throw any more forwards into the mix that we should be considering? Yeah, uh, Immobile, I'm, I'm an owner, so I'm in there. Um, you know, I was maybe a little bit disappointed that he didn't um, get a little bit more of a reward in that opening game, how the game panned out at Turks. I think he was maybe a, a little bit unlucky. Took his goal well. I think he, he made it look very easy. But uh, you know, replays show that it was a it was a fairly difficult chance and, and, and slotted that home comfortably. Uh, one player I don't want to jump on the bandwagon, but the, what about the guy from the Czech Republic, Schlick? Um, uh, go on, you, you explain why you like him. Um, look, um, six attempts, 
five on target in a in a group where I think the Czech, you know, they've, they've got that little bit of momentum. I don't think they'll be um, faced by Croatia in any way, shape or form. I think they can threaten England. It depends on, again, it depends on how the other the fixtures and results go on. Um, if we're looking purely from a fan team perspective, you know, somebody who just likes to, you know, I was going to say shoot on sight, but maybe he doesn't even have to be in sight is shoot. You know, that's always a, a good little trait to have. Um, you're talking about a good two to three point start before he even does a thing with somebody like that in your team. Um, I also like uh, Yerachuk from the Ukraine. Like say, yes, yeah. Um, decent. So again, another player that likes to shoot. Ukraine, good attacking team. Don't give up. Work hard. Uh, they've got something to prove and play for now after that that defeat. So you know you know that they're going to go out in the next two games and and really go for it because otherwise you know they're out of the tournament. So it's always good if you're looking to make transfers at this point to try and lock in players who are going to have something to play for in these next you know match day two and match day three. Schick, um, I think has some interesting data to back him up a little bit as well in terms of fan team. He takes quite a few shots. He had six shots in total, which is the joint most of any player in the tournament so far. And in terms of shots inside the box as well, joint top for that. He, the first, uh, sorry, the wonder goal was obviously a wonder goal. It had a 0.03 xG, but the second one was quite good. And what I think the Czech Republic are good at, which plays into his hands, is they're fantastic on set piece work. So. Uh, I don't hate that as a choice at all. And then in Uremchuk as well, I, I like and I back Ukraine to do quite well going towards the end of this group stage. There's going to be a lot of goals in that tournament, I feel. Uh, sorry, in that specific group. So I totally agree with you. Just to wrap up then, Ben, any transfers that you're making? Obviously, uh, sadly, with the situation with Ericsson, I have to get him out of my team. So just to keep people up to date with that. I think I'll be moving him in terms of Fantasy Euro to get Mobile. So you get two free transfers in Fantasy Euro. And in fan team, I'm thinking that I'll just do a double up of Netherlands and have Wijnaldum and Depay. Uh, but that's not in, set in stone. I will try and keep people up to date on Twitter. But my, my hand has almost been forced because of the terrible, terrible situation. And just to reiterate... We wish Ericsson well. And for people that are interested or maybe worried about similar things happening, Ben, you did a fantastic interview uh, with a cardiologist, uh, a great one there, just to remind people about that. But on the transfers, Ben, who are you bringing in? Who's going to be in and out of Differential Dinnery's team? Uh, look, I'm with you. Uh, Hans been forced. I went with Ericsson across all teams and all formats. Um, Same as me. Yeah, but I don't have any Dutch cover at all. Um, and I like Wijnaldum. I like think I say he's at, he's at a nice price point. Um, so he will be, at the, as it stands, he will be my one in and one out. Ericsson out for Wijnaldum across all formats and all teams. Well, that is the end of the show there then I hope that you've enjoyed this match day analysis. And in terms of it as well, if you've missed any of the data or want to look back, I've been doing daily threads on Twitter, but I've also been doing daily content on the YouTube channel, analysing all the essential data tactics in each of the games. So do make sure to check those videos out. But for now, from us, that is updated with our teams as much as possible, giving you an update on where we think these groups are going and we just wish you the best of luck before I hand over to Mr. Ben to sign us out. Yeah, thanks Jason. Thanks again for all your hard work. Like I say, Jason isn't understating the fact um, that he is grafting immensely hard during this tournament and um, putting social media posts out, you know, immediately after post-match and then following that with an, in, you know, in-depth analysis uh, through the YouTube. So please, please, Check them out. Honestly, you will not be disappointed. There are some real nuggets uh, and great insights 
that Jason's providing in there. And we've also got loads of other content coming around. I mean, we touched upon, uh, you know, the, the tragic unfolding of what happened on, on Saturday with Christian Eriksen. We spoke to Saudi Razi, uh, who's a cardiologist, US-based cardiologist, who give us some fantastic insight into, you know, the hows and the whys and, and the long-term prognosis with that. And, you know, we will be looking to provide more quality content as the tournament progresses. But, you know, keep the questions coming, keep watching, keep following, keep listening, and we'll be back very soon. That's it for now.